Welcome to Inside the Skeb, and I'm your host, Aaron Maslianski. Today we're here with Michelle Friedman, and Michelle is an advocate for many different things throughout the community. And, you know, we're speaking here over Zoom, and we were hoping to be, we had scheduled this to be in person, um, but I'm happy for technology. Um, but, you know, I go back to knowing Michelle from my time as an elementary school student at Hill Torah, where you came in to talk about your experience of uh, being a blind person living in the world and you know how things are the same and how things are different and how you adapt. And you know we're going through some different things right now to adapt. So why don't you tell us a little bit about you know, why you're such a great advocate and you know, how have you been adapting to the pandemic and the stay at home order? So one of the things that I, you know, I firmly believe is that as a disabled person, you know, we're all adapting right now, but I think disabled people have learned to adapt in many ways long before the coronavirus. So I think adapting um, <laughs> for me is nothing new. I have adapt all the time and have to make adjustments and figure things out. And so I think in some ways I have a leg up on uh, some of you maybe in adapting. Um, but I do find that, you know, in many ways, in many um, parts of my life, adapting is what we as disabled people do often. Uh, yeah. So, so but, I mean, in terms of like right now, I mean, what have some of the things been? Because I've, I've read some articles like in, in some of the newspapers about how it's harder in certain respects for people who have disabilities right now uh, with the stay at home order. But I mean, what are some things that you've dealt with? So it is harder for some you know, people with disabilities, like there are some issues around decision making if somebody with a disability that's made the news, if somebody with a disability gets the virus, you know, and there's a limited amount of um, ventilators, those kinds of things, will disabled people, will the decision be made that disabled people's, you know, are, are not going to get ventilators because of quality of, you know, do they have a quality of life? I say that we certainly do, and I would not want to be one not to get a ventilator because of my disability. Um, and there are other opportunities, you know, not for me because I live with, you know, an able-bodied husband and I have an able-bodied son that is now home from college. So grocery shopping for me is not an issue, but grocery shopping can be an issue for people with disabilities that it's already challenging and they need help and getting that help and, you know, is, is, can be challenging. Um, you know, I think one of the, so those are challenges. I think one of the areas that I think is a plus for people with disabilities is that, you know, we have been asking for, in, in terms of jobs and other issues, reasonable accommodations. Often reasonable accommodations can be re working remotely, working from home, doing more stuff on the computer, and now the entire world is doing it. Um, we're all being, you know, faced with having to learn new technology. I, this Zoom thing is kind of new to me, um, <laughs> which has been a little challenge figuring it out, but I've done it. Um, but remote, remote working and remote learning and using the computer is something that disabled people can do quite easily and do easily. And it, you know, we, we're seeing now that we can all work from home. And most of us can work from home. A lot of us can, yeah, and it's like when we're forced to do something, um, we're able to shift. Right. And I think that's you know one thing that is uh, a real good life lesson uh, here. Uh, you know, to go back to where I first met you, you know, coming and speaking and talking about um, what you know you deal with and being out there, and you spoke in it tons of places. What got, gave you that motivation to go and start to become an advocate? So it's actually, if I can go back a little bit to my early, I've been visually impaired since I was about eight years old, but visually impaired, legally blind. I was able to, you know, get by as a sighted person most of the time, except, you know, I didn't drive things like that. There were times in school. So for most of my growing up years, I was you know, visually impaired, but I didn't accept that as part of my identity. I didn't consider myself disabled. I didn't want to be considered disabled. When I was 35 years old, I lost the remainder of my vision and um, <laughs> that it became impossible to hide it and pretend anymore. How did but, this happen? What, what, what's happened at eight and then what happened at 35? So when I was about five years old, I developed a um, 
autoimmune disease called uveitis. And I had secondary to that, I had also juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. But the uveitis, which is an, it's an it, autoimmune disease, your eye, you know, the function of your eye fights itself, basically. And secondary to that, I got glaucoma, I got cataracts. Um, I had lots of surgery as a child. I had times where I could see a little better. I had vision only in one eye since I was about 10 years old and very minimal vision. I only had um, mostly, I had no perif peripheral vision, no night vision. Um, but I, like I said, I, you know, I went to regular school. My peers were, um, you know, typical non-disabled students and I didn't want to be different back then. Of course. Um, I'm sorry. Oh, I said, of course. So you yeah. want to be, you want to fit in your kid. Right. I wanted, and that, look, listen, I'm 62 years old. We're talking long before the Americans with Disability, Disabilities Act and long before there were rules and, and guidance for schools and my parents. So we kind of figured it all out on our own. We were lucky to have gone to, I was lucky to have gone to a um, small parochial school. I went to Akiba and Hillel Torah and the Ida Crown Jewish Academy. So I was fortunate that we were able to advocate for ourselves and get, you know, mostly what I needed to be able to get through school. Um, I then went to college and again, pre-ADA and, you know, I, I never met any people with disabilities. I was, so I didn't have any real role models. I didn't want to be labeled as a disabled person. I felt there would be a stigma. I was very fortunate that in 1980, I had gotten fired from a job in a nursing home. <laughs> Um, fortunate because I was looking for a job and that was back in the days when we found jobs through you know we took out the Tribune and you know looked in the Tribune for the Sunday when they had all the ads for jobs took out my little magnifying glass and I scoured and I, I needed a job that I had a mental health background I had a bachelor's degree in, in psychology um, I had not yet gone for my master's but um, I was looking for a job in the mental health profession. I needed one that didn't require driving because I couldn't drive. Couldn't, you know, getting around town was a little challenging for me. Um, I, because I was, you know, not admitting that I was disabled. I didn't go for any orientation mobility training. I had no training. I failed Braille back when I was 16. I actually failed Braille twice since then, but that's another story. <laughs> um, and I, happened to come upon a job that said disability preferred. I, I nearly fainted. I couldn't get my resume in the mail fast enough. Um, I was very fortunate. I actually went for an interview and I walked into what was Access Living, which was brand new at the time, an independent living center downtown. And everybody in there was disabled. Um, staff were disabled. The, everybody but the, the uh, driver that they had that they, they had a driver that worked for them. He was the only able-bodied person. I mean, there were people with, you know, there were in wheelchairs, there was um, a woman who had no arms and legs, was an electric wheelchair, who drove a van. I mean, it was life-changing for me. And all I wanted was that job. And I was very fortunate to have gotten that job. And from that day on, from that point on in my life, I realized I was disabled and there wasn't a stigma to being disabled, that I could be a you know, highly functioning, successful disabled person and embrace my disability. Um, I became a disability advocate way back then. Um, we were you know, the first independent living center in Chicago. We were working with individuals, helping them to gain their independence, um, as well as advocating in the community and nationally um, for disability rights. They really and, defined you in a way. It, 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 it defined me. It defined me and it allowed me to accept my disability and be proud of my disability. But I was, I was still visually impaired. I was, you know, still had some sight and, you know, there were times when I could still fake it if I wanted to within my community. I got, I got my master's when I was at Access Living. I got married and I got pregnant with my first son. Well, I didn't get pregnant at Access Living, but I did get pregnant <laughs> when I was at Access Living. Thank you for the clarification. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I made the decision to, to stay home with my son when it was time to go back to work after my maternity leave. And I needed some way to, um, I wanted to be involved and be active and not just be a stay-at-home mom, but also be able to be a stay-at-home mom which is when I got involved in 
um, volunteering in my community with the kids' school. I was on the board of Polatora. Um, I did some work with um, Shalva, which is the agency that helps Jewish domestic violence, um, victims of Jewish domestic violence. But I wanted to give back and I was able to do that. And then at the age of 35, I lost the remainder of my vision. I had had, um, because my eye was so sick, I had had some corneal decompensation and some kind of complicated, it's involved. But I had some surgery to have a cornea transplant because the eye was such an unhealthy eye, it was unsuccessful. So I had lost the remainder of my vision, you know, that, that morning of the surgery. And well, I had a very difficult first year. I, I had a- <laughs> Yeah, how did you cope with that? So I didn't cope with it so well, actually, the first year. I, um, there were a lot of first, nobody told me what it would be like. Nobody told me that there were also, you know, your brain needs time to adjust and there would be some, you know, visual sensations that you get that would throw you off. And, you know, I didn't know what to expect or the, what some of what I was going through was normal. So I actually had about um, a year of what I call my little loving bout of agoraphobia. Um, I became an expert liar that year, pretend, you know, not, not admitting that I was having anxiety and panic disorders to most people that I couldn't, you know, leave my house. Um, but I had two small children. I had a, I think back then I had a, uh, I think they were five and eight, something like that. So I, I had two choices. I could give in to the anxiety and panic disorder, never leave my house, never do things with my kids. I missed my daughter's, um, um, I think at that, I forgot what I missed. I missed something that she had because I got in the car and was on my way and turned to my husband and said, I can't go, I can't go, I can't do it, take me home. And I, I he went, I stayed home because I was just really struggling. Just being outside and seeing people or just? Uh, it was more being outside and just, it, there was a sense of a loss of control, you know, not to be too graphic. You know, there were issues that went through my head, like what if I got sick and I was, you know, alone. And what if I got, we had to go to the bathroom and there was nobody there to help me to the bath, those kinds of issues. So it, it created a great deal of anxiety. I have since found out that that is not unusual for people facing disabilities. Um, you know, you know, they came on suddenly like that, but nobody told me that. And I had no role models. I had no guidance. I was fortunate in that I had a very supportive family. Um, but I also realized that I had two choices. I could live like this and not leave my house and not go to my, you know, stop my organizational involvement, not do things with my kids, or I could get my, you know, get my, get my stuff together. Yeah. <laughs> I'll keep it clean. And I went for help. I went for, um, I went for some therapy. I got, you know, I didn't want to be, I had, I had gone on anti-anxiety medications. I didn't want to spend the rest of my life on those. So I really did, I went for help. I got some mobility and, and orientation training to be able to use the cane, which I had a significant amount of um, angst about using. There was something about the white cane that, you know, I felt, I felt that I was gonna be judged by my cane and not by who I was. And the first thing people saw was my cane and not, you know, who I was. Right. So I had to get through that and, you know, learn some, I had tried again to learn Braille and I failed again, but I don't, that's okay. Must be hard. <laughs> you know what, I don't, I, I really, I do a lot of audio books, you know, everything in my house talks to me except my husband and my college age students. So <laughs> um, you know, my computer talks to me, my phone, actually they do talk to me. But you must be thankful for technology now. <laughs> I, I can't imagine what it would have been like to have lost my vision 30 years ago. I had never actually touched a computer before I went blind. I didn't know the first thing about a computer. I didn't really even know how to type because in high school, when we were taking, we had a choice of typing or I think maybe it was home ec, I don't remember. I didn't want to learn to type because what, you know, being a court stenographer was one of those typical jobs blind people got through the Department of Rehab Services and I didn't want, that's not what I wanted for myself. Yeah. So, you know, I, I did have that year of having to get myself my head together, you know, get my ducks in a row, learn some new skills, learn some new coping skills. And after that, you know, there, not, nothing, there was nothing stopping me from doing anything I wanted. And I got back into life full swing and 
just to answer your question, that was a long way to get to answering your question. Um, I embrace my, my identity as a disabled person. And I felt it was my responsibility, my, my, perhaps my purpose in life to educate kids, educate adults, and, you know, do what I could to bring the, the, the um, I can't think of the word, but, but bring disability awareness to the forefront. And so that's what I do. Um, I am, you know, besides my family, my two passions are disability awareness and my organizational work. And they, they are also hand in hand. Well, I think it's, you know, it's incredibly important. And, you know, I look back to when I grew up and, you know, you coming in to speak and, you know, Keshet was at the school and they're, they're a wonderful organization that helps people with, you know, different, a variety of disabilities and with uh, their education. Right. And, um, you know, it, it, it kind of breaks down those barriers of the unknown. Right. And, you know, I think that probably back in the day there, there was a lot of making fun of and stigma, which is so cruel in many ways. Uh, but those, you know, what you've done and what the, you know, Kesha, and I know you're involved there, has really helped, um, you know, just make everyone comfortable with each other and realize that we have so many similarities and how we can each benefit each other. And we're all the same people, you know? Right. right. So, right. So I actually, I wrote a children's book. I actually wrote two children's books. My first children's book, which was my second one that I published, um, was just a sort of a fun book that I actually illustrated with a friend of ours, Debbie Geller. She illustrated it for me. It was uh, my first book. I had done it because I couldn't read books to my grandchildren and I would tell them stories. Um, and I had this brilliant idea one day to write the story down. But my first book, which was actually my second book that I published, <laughs> is called Close Your Eyes. And I, I wrote that because it's about a young girl who is blind and all the things she can do, but she has to do differently and, you know, the friendships. But I wrote that for two reasons. One is I wanted um, non-disabled children to have a book and a story that showed kids that, well, we're all the same and we're all different. I mean, we're all different and we're all the same. Right. Um, and it's, you know, we learn from each other. Um, and we, you know, if we can, if we can get past some of the stigmas we have, we can learn from each other about our differences and what makes us the same. And, um, but I also wrote the book also for young disabled children to have a book about them. That was a story that showed them as the main character. Um, and when, and I use that now in schools and I talk about that we really are all, you know, we're all the same and we all have differences and what a freaking boring world it would be if everybody was like me. I mean, you know, I may be interested <laughs> in five seconds, um, but there would be a really boring world if we were all the same. And if everybody was like me, I, it would be a boring world. You know, what's interesting is that some of these books that, you know, you read about like futuristic books of, um, you know, like 1984, different things like that, sure. where, where the nightmare is that everybody is the same right. and everybody, a totalitarianism, right. and a, you know, where it's communism or, or whatever it may be. And I think one of the beautiful things is that we have so many differences that we can appreciate that makes it all interesting. Right. Yeah. And, you know, we talk about inclusion and, you know, that's a big word now and, you know, inclusion is fabulous, but I, I really believe that inclusion is a means to an end and the end is belonging. We all belong in this world, whether we're in a wheelchair, whether we use a white cane, you know, whether we're deaf, um, you know, we're hard to, whatever it is. Um, the ideal is belonging. I belong in this world with my differences, with my strengths, with my weaknesses, with, you know, with certain things that I need help the same way you do and everybody else does. And I, I want to belong and not just be included. I actually feel that, you know, for the most part, I have found that place of belonging that came from being included. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the book, you know, I, I, I've read it and it's, it's just a great way to reach kids and to, to show that in an easy manner. Right. So that was my goal. And I use it to, you know, when I go into schools, which, well, I used to do that a lot. I, <laughs> the, the, this virus seems to have, you know, put a little damper on that. Um, but I do, I read, you know, I, so the teacher or somebody who's with me reads the book 
and we talk about it and we do this whole kind of with the little kids i do this whole interactive thing where we you know i show them ways you know we talk about they ask me questions i show them ways that you know i don't hear better than the average person um i just use my hearing better and i show them ways that we do that and sometimes i think just by being there with my cane you know being a blind person answering their questions breaks down a lot of the barriers you know it, it normalizes it normalizes disability it normalizes blindness um you know they're not afraid they my my hope would be that as we you know talk about disability issues with little kids and i go into schools and other people go into schools that you know down the line some point in the future dis disabled people being in the workforce and the school force you know being in the dating world all that will be just normal there won't be a you know there will i'm sure there will always be a need for the laws but that the laws won't be necessary because it won't be it'll be a, a given not a right. not a mandated thing right, it'll because just be what people do yeah i mean exactly. but i imagine with kids there's also you know, a lot of questions that they may have. Oh yeah. What are what are some of the questions that uh, they've asked you? Well, it depends on the age. The little kids are the best. They want to know how I get dressed. They want to know, um, you know, I, I do this thing where I say, "Do you think I can ski?" And they go, "No." I go, well, "I can. I have." And I go, "You know, do you think that I can do ceramics and make pottery and bowls?" They go, "No." I say, "I do." You know, and I go on with a few things, you know, do you think I can horseback ride? No. And then I get to, do you think I can drive? And they go, by now they go, yeah. I go, <laughs> no, the one thing, I can't. I, and I, they, but they'll ask me, how do I get dressed? How do I brush my teeth? How do I eat? Things like that. And I, you know, I don't, I never mind the questions. I want them to know. I do those things, most of those things, the same as they do. I don't read the same as they do. I listen to books and, you know, audio. I'm an avid reader and I, listen to books thank god for audible right now yeah um but i i, I you know i love their questions you know and then they'll <laughs> you know they'll ask me you know do i have a dog and i used to but you know not that kind of a dog and you know how do i take care of my dog how do i clean up the poop things like that <laughs> you <laughs> know one question, question they may ask you though is when you dream do you see things oh yes they do ask me that now that's usually not the littlest kids, the sort of the first, second, third graders. They do ask that. That's a common one. And it's interesting because they, you know, I tell them, I, I do dream. I happen to be what's called um, advantageously blind, meaning I became blind before the age, after the age of three years old. So I have images in my head. If you ask, you know, say to me, it's a red ball, I can make a picture in my head of a red ball. So I have images and pictures in my head. I do dream in pictures, and the best part of my dreams is I am always sighted in my dreams. It's great. And the best part is I drive in my dreams. <laughs> I have actually, in my dreams, I have actually been known to drive a car. It's amazing. <laughs> it's amazing what can happen in dreams. I mean, for, right now I've been experiencing the weirdest dreams I've ever had in my <laughs> life. Uh, and I think it's common with what's going on with the coronavirus where people are afraid. I mean, um, you know, so it's, it's vivid, but I imagine it's, it's um, you know, it must be unique for, for you to have dreams where you can see and you could, you know, actually one thing that I, I find interesting to go back a little bit is I didn't learn how to ride a bike until I was 22 years old. Wow. <laughs> and I don't know why, it's just, I tried as a kid, I couldn't get it. And I finally took a class when I was 22 and um, I learned. But for years, I would have dreams where I was riding a bike before I knew how. And it was just like something well, psychological to right. let myself like get over this. I mean, yeah. I imagine that's with you driving a car in many ways. But yeah, yeah. And I, when I first went blind that first year, I had some pretty scary, really crazy, I mean, they were crazy dreams. And I think that's how our mind, um, copes with trauma and with you know difficult things i mean i had some crazy dreams scary dreams i mean i wake up sweating you know that was kind of dreams but i don't have those anymore yeah. um but i think you know our mind deals with trauma in a lot of different ways and this is going to be a this is going to be an interesting time moving forward from this whole thing we're dealing with now um you know with with trauma and with you know dealing with those kinds of things it's going to be an interesting time
It is. <laughs> One of the organizations that you do a lot of work with is Institute for Therapy Through the Arts. And I, I had Jenny Rook on, who's the executive director. Right. And, um, you know, they do some great, great work um, with doing therapy through many different manners where it could be music therapy, it could be art therapy, it could be drama therapy. What got you into working with them? So it's actually a kind of an interesting story. I, I consider myself a professional volunteer. I have been serving on boards for the past 30 years. Um, so, and it's a volunteer position. I've served on about seven or eight different organizations. I've served in the capacity of president of a few. I'm the fundraising chair of a few. Um, I actually had retired a couple of years ago from volunteering and doing board work, but um, I got back involved with Keshat and realized how, you know, they asked me to serve on the board. And I, after a little hemming and hawing, I said, yes, because I, I believe in the work Kesha does. Sure. Um, but I also realized how much I enjoy um, board involvement and getting involved with organizations that I believe in. And one of the organizations that I got involved in was ADA 25 Advancing Leadership, which is a disability organization um, that has several parts to it. They, they train people to be civic leaders, they train people to be disability advocates. And I got involved with one of their projects that they link um, disabled people who want to serve on boards with organizations in the community. And you fill out a form and you put your number one, number two, number three, um, you know, what you would like to be involved with. And I saw Institute for Therapy Through the Arts. They do creative, um, they do therapy using the creative arts, as you said. And um, as a mental health professional, and as somebody who has been doing ceramics for the past 12 years, and I love the creative aspect of the ceramics, and I certainly love mental health, I was very intrigued with Institute for Therapy of the Arts. I put them down as my number one choice, and um, I met with Jenny and their president at the time and interviewed for a board position. And fortunately for me, they um, asked me to serve on the board. And it fit for me both in terms of um, my board involvement. It's, it's a younger organization, they're only four years old. Mm -hmm. I like the idea of getting involved, you know, again, in a new young, mm -hmm organization and helping them continue to grow and fundraise, et cetera. And it fit my, my creative, you know, I believe in the, the, the healing powers of the creative arts. Um, for me, doing pottery and ceramics is, is healing. It's normalizing. I, I go to the Evanston Art Center and I am, I'm just another one of the, you know, one of the gang. There's yeah. nothing about, you know, there's no big deal about my blindness. They accommodate me. They, you know, help um, make things easier for me. But I'm just one of the I'm just one of the gang, and it's very normalizing. And I know that the creative arts can be very healing. So, Institute for Therapy through the Arts fit for me. And right now, with everything going on, um, you know, I, I see a great need for ITA. Um, they are actually doing telehealth um, therapy, and they you know increase their telehealth. You know, the insurance pays for it, but they're also offering more in terms of sliding scales to make sure that people can be served. And I think right now, you know, the creative arts can be an amazing healing um, opportunity for people who are going through trauma and, you know, dealing with difficult things. So for me, having done that a year, I think it's been, a, so it's, it hasn't even been a year, but getting on the board of um, ITA was just a fabulous opportunity for me. And it came at, the right time for me as it yeah. Yeah. they are they are great and i know i've spoken with jenny and they were trying to transition everything to the telehealth this is yep. you know, a month ago and i know so many of their clients are at senior uh, care facilities yeah. and they can't go in there um obviously because of uh, you know, trying to prevent any spread of any disease right. uh, but it, this is the time that everyone needs each other. So I'm so glad they're able to do the telehealth and really continue to serve the community. Yeah, and, and they, you know, the, some of the hospitals, it's been, you know, challenging to get in there, but they're, you know, we're still offering, you know, our services and, you know, to the, you know, this, you know, we go into schools as well. Now there's no school, but they're around and they're, they're 
they're willing to, you know, make it work so that people can get the help they need. And I think we are, I think the next thing we're going to be dealing with is a mental health pandemic after this. It's, yeah, I agree. Especially with people losing jobs and, and, and whatnot and, and lives and what. yeah, It's tough. Um, you know, but I think one of the things that you do also is you're a life coach and yeah. you, uh, you know, we've talked about this now where you've gone through some adversity and a lot of people are, going through it, but everyone's going through adversity right now. We're all going in this together, which actually is, you know, kind of, kind of <laughs> helpful, yeah. you know, where we can all have this shared experience. Yeah. But what are some of the things that you do as a life coach and, you know, how do people work with you? So, you know, it's interesting because, you know, we're, we're now getting into telehealth and telemedicine and remote working. I've been doing it since I started coaching. Um, I think it's been like 18 years. Um, life co my life coaching and most life coaching is done over the phone. Um, now that I'm seeming to get expert at Zoom, I could do it on <laughs> Zoom too, actually. But um, it's not therapy, so we're not dealing with, I sort of equate it with driving a car, which you know, is ironic that I equate it with driving a car. But you know, I look at therapy as looking behind in the rear view mirror and what got you to here. But I look at life coaching as looking forward and you know, how do we go from here to where you want to be in the future? You know, I serve as sort of a cheerleader and a, you know, I, I can, you know, be there right alongside you. I can, you know, help you <laughs> figure out ways, you know, you're figuring out the ways, but I'm there to help guide you and, you know, help you get through the mountain, over the mountain, around the mountain to get to your goal. Um, so it's all very goal oriented and future focused as opposed to therapy, which is really looking at how I got here. Um, this is about, you know, moving forward. And I do all my work on the phone. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's not, so nothing, so I don't have to change anything with this new reality. It's no different. Nope. I feel like you get a lot of joy in, in helping people overcome these things and, you know, be, you know, all the work that you do, right? I do. I do, and I, I get, you know, all my work is kind of different from my life coaching, which deals, you know, one-on-one -on -one with people who want to move forward to my going into schools and talking to kids, um, working, you know, on boards like Kesha and ITA. I do get, an, you know, they all have a, an element of growth and helping and moving forward, and I do enjoy that part. I think it's wonderful. You know, where can people reach out to you if they want to, you know, just get in touch with you or do life coaching or you know, get that. So point. they can reach me at my email address, which is M Friedman, F R I E D M A N, 1204 at gmail.com. Um, or my Facebook page, Michelle Rosen Friedman. I also have an Instagram account, um, which is out of sight ceramics, because I do <laughs> I do my ceramics and I post it on there because I also have an Etsy page. But, um, and, uh, you know, Facebook, I pretty much those are it, I think. Okay. Um, and you're on, on LinkedIn too, right? Oh, I am on LinkedIn. I, f I always forget about LinkedIn. Yes, I am on LinkedIn. You know, I'm a little old. So, you know, I, I, all this technology and all this LinkedIn and Facebook and Instagram. And now I hear TikTok, which I'm never going on. Um, but, yeah. I, it's, you know, it's all a little, it's awesome. It's a learning curve for me. And I, one thing I can honestly say is over the last so many years i have i've learned a lot fortunately i have a college-age student who helps me along and he's home right now <laughs> that is very helpful <laughs> yes yeah I, my, I, my grandchildren seem to know a little bit more about this technology than i do it's fascinating <laughs> well my kids are seven and, and nine almost ten and i feel like they've gone <laughs> through a transformation in the past month where they're like teenagers now because they're using right. Facebook Messenger for kids. And, you know, we're doing, um, you know, they're playing remote games like Rummy Cube. My daughter was playing right. with, my, with my mom. And then they're like, you know, video chatting. And my dad's playing Stratomatic Baseball <laughs> with my son. And it's just like, it's, it's a very interesting time. And I feel like we've all, like, we've all pushed to adapt and to learn new things in order to be able to yep. cope with what's going on. Listen, I've got kids, I've got grandchildren in Israel and I've got grandchildren in Philadelphia. So I, I'm, you know, we were actually supposed to be going to Israel for Passover. We obviously that didn't happen, but I'm, I don't know when I'm going to see my kids again, but we've been doing, um, 
we, and I want them to be connected with each other. So we've been doing, we did a Zoom um, scavenger hunt one day at a Zoom talent show, which is interesting for me, but you know, I want, <laughs> I want the kids to be engaged with me and with each other. And you know, we, we, we do what we have to do, which is basically how I live my life as a disabled person. I do what I have to do. I figure out, and, I, and most disabled people, we figure out what we have to do. I always say necessity is the mother of invention. Um, we do what we have to do and I'm okay sometimes saying, you know, I need help or I'm willing to say, you know what, I don't really want to be doing this, so I'm not going to. And I can be okay with that, yeah. usually. <laughs> I think that's the key for all of us. <laughs> right. But we're not well, always, not all of us are always willing to say I'm, you know, I'm okay with it. No. But, uh, you know, I started out with this whole disability thing feeling I needed to be this super blind woman and I needed to be an example for everybody and I had to do it. I had to use my cane all the time and I had to learn braille. And I, then I really gave myself permission to, I don't have to do it all. If, if learning braille doesn't work for me, it's not stopping me from reading books and giving speeches and all that. I've just figured it out to do a different way. Um, so I think we have to be kinder to each other, be kinder to ourselves and give ourselves permission to do the best we can do as long as it's the best we can do or the best we want to do. You're right. Well, Michelle, I, I really appreciate you coming on the show and talking with everybody and giving us such uh, inspiration uh, today. And, um, you know, just, just thank you and keep doing what you're doing. And if anybody wants to know about my book, I'm actually going to be putting them on my Instagram and Etsy shop, whatever that's called, uh, today or tomorrow. So if anybody's interested in my books, they can look it up there. Okay, and I'll also post a link to it in the show notes. Great, Aaron, a pleasure as always. You've grown up a lot. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit, yes. <laughs> a little bit. It's, it's nice to see you all grown up uh, with kids of your own. Thank you. All right, thanks, Aaron. I appreciate it. Pleasure. Take care. Take care.